Hello, welcome to the virtual reading of The Lemonade War, and this is Chapter 8, Going Global. Global is an adjective, and it means throughout the world, refers to expanding one's market beyond the immediate area of production. On Saturday morning, Jessie slept in. And even when she opened her eyes at 9.05, she still felt tired. How can I wake up tired? She wondered as she buried her face in her pillow and dozed off. Five minutes later, she was awake for real. She was awake for real, remembering why she was so tired. Yesterday's lemonade stand had been the hardest work of her life. Face painting, hair braiding, nail polishing. It had sounded like such a good idea. Jessie had been sure that every kid in the neighborhood would line up to buy a cup of lemonade. But that was the problem. Every kid had lined up for lemonade and then wanted face painting and hair braiding and fingernail polishing and toenail polishing. One boy had asked for face paintings on both cheeks, both arms, and his stomach. One girl begged for lots of little braids with ribbons woven in. And the nail polishing, they all wanted different colors and decals, and it was impossible to get them to sit still long enough for the polish to dry. We're going to run out of lemonade, Megan had said to Jessie at noon, as the line stretched all the way down the street. Pour half cups instead of full ones, whispered Jessie. It has to last. Jessie and Megan had each made $24 on lemonade, but they've worked eight hours to do it. At the end of the day, they'd agreed. A good idea, but not worth it. After breakfast, Jessie pulled out her lock box and sat on her bed. She kept the box hidden in her closet on a shelf under some sweaters. She kept the key in a plastic box in her desk drawer. The plastic box was disguised to look exactly like a pack of gum. You would never know it was hollow and had a secret sliding panel on its side. Jessie unlocked the box and opened the lid. First, she took out the three torn slips of paper. There was one for value added and one for goodwill. There was also a new one that Jessie had added last night. Profit margin. Sales less all operating costs divided by the number of sales. The result is a ratio. For example, if it costs you $300 to make 100 hats and you sell those hats for $500, the profit margin is 500 minus 300 over 100 equals 2 over 1. Jessie lined up all three scraps of paper on the bed beside her. She wasn't sure why she was saving these words, but she felt like they belonged in her lockbox. Next, she took out her lemonade earnings. Every day, Megan had squealed over how much money they'd make. But every day, Jessie had known it's not enough. It's not going to be enough to win. Jessie counted the money. So far, she had earned $40. It was a lot of money, but it wasn't nearly enough. She still needed to earn 60 more dollars, and today was Saturday, only two more selling days before she and Evan counted their earnings on Sunday night. 
how was she going to sell enough lemonade to earn $60 in two days? She couldn't. That was the problem. No kid could earn $100 in just five days by selling lemonade. The profit margin was too small. She knew because she used her calculator to figure it out last night. The number said it all. There was no way two girls in one neighborhood could sell 375 cups of lemonade. Nobody wanted that much lemonade, no matter how hot the day was. Jessie looked at that money in her lockbox and the page of calculations on her desk. Any other kid would have quit, but Jessie wasn't a quitter. On good days, Jessie's mom called her persistent. On bad days, she told her she just didn't know when enough was enough. Jessie reached for 10 bright ideas to light up your sales, which is the book. It was on her bedside table, right next to Charlotte's web. Jessie's hand hovered. She looked longingly at Wilbur and Fern, watching Charlotte hanging by a thread. But this was war, and she couldn't stop to read for fun. She grabbed the booklet and opened it to bright idea number six. An hour later, she had a new scrap of paper stashed in her lockbox and a whole new page of calculations on her desk. It might work. It could work, but she and Megan would have to risk everything, everything they've earned over the past three days, and Jessie would have to be braver than she had ever been in her whole life. Jessie carried her lockbox and calculations downstairs. She went into the kitchen and pulled down the school directory, scanning the names of all the third grade girls from last year. She knew them all, from Evan, from, she knew them all, from Evan, from recess, and from the lunchroom. She knew who they were. She knew their faces. Which ones were nice, which ones were not so nice. But she didn't really know any of them. Not enough to call them up. Not enough to say, um, what, what to do something, want to do something today? Not enough to ask. Would you like to have a lemonade stand with me? These girls were going to be her classmates. Jessie felt her face grow hot and her upper lip start to sweat. What was it going to feel like to walk into that classroom on the first day of school with all those eyes looking at her? Would they stare? Would they tease? Would they ignore her? Even if she said hi? Jessie looked at the names, then slammed the directory shut. She couldn't do it. She just wasn't brave enough. Evan walked into the kitchen and grabbed an apple from the fruit bowl. A cloud of fruit flies rose up in the air and settled again. Evan inspected the apple and then bit into it without washing it first. Jessie wanted to say something, but she held her tongue. She looked at him and thought, it is never going to feel normal, not talking to Evan. Hey, she said. Evan raised his apple to her, his mouth too stuffed to talk. So, is, uh, is Paul coming over today? She asked. Evan shook his head, munching noisily. Well, is anyone coming over? Jessie was curious to see what the enemy was up to today. Yesterday, Evan's smile had told her plenty. He had sold a lot of lemonade. A lot. But what was he going to do today? Evan shrugged his shoulders. He swallowed so hard it looked like he was choking down an ocean liner. But you are setting up a stand, right? asked Jessie. Nah, I'm good, said Evan, looking closely at his apple. I'm just gonna take it easy today. He took another enormous bite 
and walked out of the kitchen and down the basement stairs. Take it easy? How could he take it easy? You didn't take it easy when you were in the middle of a war. Unless... Unless he had already won the war. Could that be possible? It was impossible. There was no way Evan had earned a hundred dollars in just three days of selling lemonade. No way! Jesse's mind skittered like one of those long-legged birds on the beach. Had he? Could he? Were her calculations wrong? Was there some other way? Had she overlooked some detail? Some trick? Was she missing something? Jesse flipped open the school directory. Maybe he had a hundred dollars. Maybe he didn't. She couldn't take a chance. She started putting pencil check marks next to the names of girls she thought might work out. She'd gone over the list twice when the doorbell rang. It was Megan. I've got a new idea, said Jesse. Oh, not more lemonade, said Megan sinking onto the couch in the family room. I'm tired of selling lemonade, and it's just too hot. I practically had sunstroke yesterday painting all those faces. We're done with that, said Jesse. No more extra services. Doesn't pay off. But here's an idea. Forget lemonade. Let's go to the 7-Eleven. Is Evan home? We could all go. No, he's not home, said Jessie, eyeing the door to the basement. She needed Megan to be on board with her plan. She needed Megan to make the phone calls. Look, this is great, and we don't need to sell the lemonade. Jessie laid out all the details. She showed Megan the new scrap of paper. Franchise. The right to sell a company's products and use the company's name and logo in a certain area. Then she showed Megan her page of calculations. At first, Megan buried her head under a pillow. But then she poked her head out like a turtle and started to listen for real. Hmm, that sounds like a pretty good plan, she said. But it really, but is it really going to work? Jessie looked at her calculations. She'd done them twice. It should, she said. I really think it should. She frowned, suddenly not so sure of herself. It's a big upfront investment and a lot of work organizing everybody. But once they're set up, we should be able to sit back and watch the money roll in. The key is spreading everybody out so there'll be plenty of customers. We'll need at least 10 girls. 15 would be better. That's the whole fourth grade class, said Megan, looking doubtful. How are we going to get them to do this? Well, you could phone them all up, said Jessie. She handed Megan the school directory. Open to the third grade page. Me? said Megan. Why me? Because they know you, said Jessie. They know you too. Yeah, but they like you. Megan shook her head. Not all these girls are my friends. Even the ones that aren't your friends, they still like you. Everybody likes you, Megan. Megan looked embarrassed. Oh, everybody likes you too, she said. No, they don't, said Jessie. They really don't. There was an uncomfortable silence between the two girls. Then Jessie shrugged her shoulders and said, I don't know why those girls in my I don't know why those girls in my class last year didn't like me. I'm hoping this year it will be better. Megan tapped her fingers on her knees. You're nervous, huh? About fourth grade? she asked. 
Jessie thought hard. I'm worried that I won't make any new friends, she said. You know, that all the kids will think I'm just some puny second grader in that. She took a deep breath. And that I don't belong. Megan looked at the ceiling for a minute. Do you have an index card, she asked. Huh? I need an index card, said Megan. Do you have one? Jessie went to the kitchen desk and got an index card. She handed it to Megan. Megan started to write something on the card. What are you doing? asked Jessie. I'm writing a comment card, said Megan. That's something you're going to miss from third grade. We did it every Friday. We each got assigned a person, and you had to write something positive about that person on an index card. Then it got read out loud. She folded up the card and handed it to Jessie. Jessie unfolded the card and read what Megan had written. You're a really nice person, and you have good ideas all the time. You're fun to be with and I'm glad you're my friend. Jessie stared at the index card. She kept reading the words over and over. Thanks, she whispered. You can keep it, said Megan. That's what I did. I've got all my comment cards in a basket on my desk, and whenever I'm feeling sad or kind of down on myself, I read through them. They really helped me feel better. Jessie folded the index card and put it in her lockbox. She was going to save it forever. It was like having a magic charm. So how about I make half the phone calls and you make the other half, said Jessie. Okay, said Megan, jumping up from the couch. It was surprising how many almost fourth grade girls had absolutely nothing to do three days before school started. In less than an hour, Jessie and Megan had 13 Lemonade franchises signed up for the day. The rest of the day was work, but it was fun. Jessie and Megan attached the old baby carrier to Megan's bike, then rode to the grocery store and spent every penny of their earnings on lemonade mix, 52 cans. They actually bought out the store. The four bags of cans filled the carrier like a boxy baby. They also bought five packages of paper cups. When they got back to Megan's home, Jessie tucked the receipt in her lockbox right next to the comment card. Jessie liked receipts. They were precise and complete. A receipt always told the whole story right down to the very last penny. Then they tossed construction paper and art, and art supplies into the carrier and started making the rounds. First stop, Sally Knight's house. She was ready for them with a table, a chair, and empty pitcher all set up. Jessie, Jessie mixed the lemonade. Megan quickly made a lemonade for sale, 70, 75 cents a cup sign, and they left Sally to her business. The deal was that Sally got to keep one-third of the profits and Jessie and Megan got to keep the rest. After they set up all 13 lemonade stands, each with enough mix to make four pitchers of lemonade, Jessie and Megan hung out at Megan's house, baking brownies and watching TV. Then they hopped on their bikes again and made the rounds. Jessie and Megan stopped in front of Sally's house first. The lemonade stand was nowhere to be seen. What'd you think is going on? asked Megan. Jessie had a bad feeling in her stomach. Something must have gone wrong. They rang the doorbell. Sally came to the door. Hurry, she said, grabbing their arms and pulling them inside. Mom goes totally mental. 
when the AC is on and the door is open. Where's your stand? asked Jesse nervously, feeling goosebumps ripple up her arms because of the suddenly cool air. Sally waved her hand. Done, she said. I sold out like half an hour. It's so darn hot. She made, we made $24 besides tips. Do I get to keep the tips? Sure, said Jessie. Tips. She forgotten about those on her calculations page. Sally handed Jessie some crumbled bills and an avalanche of coins. Eight dollars for Jessie and Megan. Each. You want to stay and have some ice cream? Sally asked. Okay, said Megan. And we bought you a thank you brownie, you know, for being part of our team. That had been bright idea number nine. After a bowl of the moose is loose ice cream, Jessie and Megan headed out. The story was the same at every girl's house. The lemonade had sold out quickly and the money just kept rolling in. I can't believe we made. How much did we make? Squealed Megan once they got back to our house. One hundred and four dollars each. Each, shouted Jessie. She couldn't stop hoping, hopping from one foot to the other. I've never seen so much money in my life. Jessie was already running numbers in her head, subtracting that the $80 that she and Megan had spent on lemonade and cups. Each girl had made a profit of $64. If they increased the number of franchisees from 13 to 26, they could each make $128 in one day. If they ran the 26 franchisees every day for one week, they could each make $896. Jessie pulled out a piece of paper and scribbled a graph. The sky was the limit. Megan pretended to faint when Jessie showed her the graph. What are you going to do with your money? She asked from the floor. Win the war, thought Jessie. Oops, she couldn't say that to Megan. Megan didn't even know about the lemonade war. After all, Megan liked Evan. Jessie suddenly wondered, if Megan knew about the war, whose side would she be on? Hmm. All at once, Jessie felt as if Evan was a hawk circling above, waiting to swoop down and snatch Megan away. Oh, she was so mad at him, he deserved to lose everything. Is $104 enough to win, wondered Jessie. Surely, Evan couldn't have earned more than that. Still, better safe than sorry. She would work all day tomorrow, Sunday, selling lemonade. So, said Megan, what are you going to do with all that money? She was kicking off her sneakers and fanning herself with a magazine. Jessie said, I'm going to donate all my money to the Animal Rescue League. Megan stopped waving the magazine. Oh, that is so nice of you. I want to donate my money too. She dropped the magazine and started shoving her money towards Jessie. Here, give mine to the Animal Rescue League too. On the card, just put both of our names. The money came at her so fast, Jessie didn't know what to say. There it was, $208, $208, all in her hands. She had won. She had really and truly won the lemonade war. Just promise me one thing, said Megan. No lemonade stand tomorrow, okay? Okay, said Jessie. She didn't need a lemonade stand on Sunday if she had $208 today. My dad, my dad said tomorrow's the last day before the heat breaks, said Megan. So we're going to 
So we're going to the beach for the whole day. Wanna come? Sure, said Jesse. Maybe Evan wants to come too, said Megan. Jesse shook her head. No, Evan's busy all day tomorrow. He told me he's got plans. Megan shrugged. Too bad for him. Yep, said Jesse, thinking of all that money. Too bad for him. Chapter 9, Negotiation. A negotiation, that's a noun. It's a method of bargaining so that you can reach an agreement. Evan looked up from the marble track he was building when Jessie walked in the front door. She looked hot. She looked sweaty. She looked happy. Really happy. Like she just gotten an A+. Plus. Or like, like she won, like she just won a war. What are you smiling for? asked Evan, holding a marble at the top of the track. No reason. Jessie put her hands on her hips and stared at Evan. She looked like one of those goofy yellow smiley faces, all mouth. Well, quit looking at me, would you? It's creep defying. You look like you're going to explode or something. Evan dropped the marble into the funnel. It raced through the track picking up speed around the curves. It passed the flywheel, sending the flag spinning, then fell into the final drop. When it reached the end of the track, it went sailing through the air like a beautiful silver bird and fell short. The marble landed on the ground instead of in the bull's eye cup. Evan muttered under his breath and adjusted the position of the cup. Raise the end of the track, said Jessie. You'll get more loft. Evan looked at her angrily. The marble had fallen into the cup the last ten times he'd done it. Why did it have to fall short the one time she was watching? Don't tell me what to do, he said. Why was she, why was she smiling like that? I didn't tell you what to do, she said. I just made a suggestion. Take it or leave it. She turned and walked up the steps. Grump Meister, Fink. Grump Mister, Fink. She tossed over her shoulder. Evan threw a marble, a marble at her disappearing back, but missed by a mile. Well, he hadn't really been aiming anyway. He just wanted that feeling of throwing something. He'd been feeling the need to throw something these past four days. Grump Minster Fink. That was the name of a character he made up when he was six and Jesse was five. That was back when mom and dad were fighting a lot and Evan and Jesse just had to get out of the house. They scrambled up the climbing tree. Evan had his branch, Jesse had hers, and waited out. Sometimes they had to wait a long time. And once when Jesse was thirsty and impatient and cranky, Evan had said, be quiet and I'll tell you a story about Grump Minster Fink. Grump Minster Fink was a man who was cranky and mean and made everybody miserable. But deep down, he wanted people to love him. It's just that Every time he tried to do something nice, it turned out all wrong. Evan had made up a lot of stories about Mr. Fink and all that tree. But after Dad left, there, w- there just weren't enough any more stories to tell. No one in the whole world besides Jesse and Evan knew about Grump Mr. Fink, and Evan hadn't thought about him in years. Hey, he said sharply. He heard Jesse stop at the top of the stairs but she didn't come down. Do you want to call this whole thing off? He asked. What? She shouted. This, this lemonade war, he said. Call it off? Yeah, he said. Just say nobody wins and nobody loses. Jessie walked down the stairs and stood with her arms crossed. Evan looked at her. He missed her. He had spent the whole day, 
the third to last day before school started by himself. It stunk. It totally stunk. If Jesse had been around and they hadn't been fighting with each other, they could have played air hockey or made pretzels or built a marble track with twice as many gizmos that launched the marble into the bull's eye cup every time. Jesse was very precise. She was good at getting the marble to go into the cup. What'd you say? He asked. Jesse looked puzzled. Hmm. No, she said, frowning. You see, Megan kind of, well, she... Evan felt his face go hot. Megan? Every time he thought of her, his throat got all squeezed and, and scratchy. She was like the allergic reaction he had if he accidentally ate a shrimp. You told Megan about everything he asked feeling itchy all over no well what everything what everything asked jesse evan thought she looked like a fish caught in a net you did and suddenly evan knew exactly why jesse had been smiling when she walked in the door and why she didn't want to call off the war she had done it again she had figured out some way to show the world just how stupid he was like the time he come home with 100 percent on his weekly spelling quiz the only time he'd ever ever got every word right to find that Jesse had won a statewide poetry writing contest. He thrown his paper into the trash without even telling his mom. What was the point? Evan didn't know how, but somehow Jesse had figured out a way to earn more than $103. She was going to beat him. And Megan knew all about it. And she would tell everyone else. All the girls would know. Paul would know. And Ryan. And Adam. And Jack. Scott Spencer would know. Can you believe it? He lost to his little sister. The one who's going to be in our class. What a loser. You know what? He said, pushing past her. Forget it. Just forget I said anything. The war is on. O-N. Prepare to die. Chapter 10. Malicious Mischief. Now that's a noun. The act of purposefully destroying the property of someone else's business. Jessie was all in knots. Evan was madder than ever at her and she couldn't figure out why. He had said, do you want to call off the war? And she had said, sure, let's call off the war or something like that. That's what she meant to say. That's what she wanted to say. But what had she really said? She mentioned Megan. Oh, she almost spilled the beans about Megan giving her the $104. But she hadn't. She kept her mouth shut. Just in time. Jesse smiled, remembering that. So why had Evan acted like that? What was the matter with him? Jesse lay down on her bed. The world was a confusing place. And she needed Evan to help her figure it out. If this is what fourth grade was going to be like, she might as well just give up now. And there was something else that was tying her up in knots. That $208, it wasn't really hers. Megan had given it to her to make a donation. She hadn't given it to Jesse the way Evan's friends had given their money to him. That still made her so mad when she thought about it. Oh, she wanted to get even with him for saying she didn't have friends. 
So even though it looked like she had $208 in her lockbox, only half of that money, only half of that was money she could honestly call her own. Still, if push came to shove, and if she needed it all to win, sure, she used it all. This was a war. But if she pretended that all the money was hers, hey, what if Evan has even more money than that? So if she lost, even with Megan's money, <clears throat> Jesse hadn't thought of that. If she lost, even with the $208, if she lost, oh my gosh, winner takes all. She would lose all Megan's money to Evan. How could Jessie explain that to her friend? You see, I took all the money you earned to help rescue animals and I lost it to my brother who's going to buy an iPod. Megan would hate her. All the girls who were friends with Megan would hate her. And Evan already hated her. So that was that. Goodbye fourth grade. She couldn't use Megan's money to try to win the bet. It was too risky. But, but did she have enough to win on her own? Jessie felt desperation rise in her throat. How much money did Evan have? She had to find out. Jessie tiptoed upstairs to the attic office. She listened at the closed door. Her mother was on the phone. Then Jessie, then Jessie smuck, she snuck downstairs. Evan was watching TV in the family room. Like a whisper, she crept back upstairs and into Evan's room. There was a trick roll in the Tresky house. No one was allowed in anyone else's room without an express invitation. That was the term. It meant that Jesse had to say, Evan, can I come into your room? And Evan had to say yes before she even put one toe over the line. So even though Evan's door was wide open, just crossing the threshold was a direct violation that carried a fine of one dollar, but that was the least of Jessie's concerns. She snuck over to Evan's bookshelf and picked up a carved cedar box, Evan's chosen souvenir from the family's summer vacation. The orange-red wood of the box had a seam etched into the top of it, a sailboat sailing past a lighthouse while gulls flew overhead. The words Bar Harbor, Maine were painted in the sky. The box had brass hinges and a clever latch. What it didn't have was a lock. Jessie flipped open the lid, immediately smelling the spicy, sharp scent of the wood. She couldn't believe her eyes. Her hands started pawing through the bills, dozens of them. There was a ten and a bunch of fives and more ones than she could count. She sat on Evan's bed and quickly sorted through the money. Evan had $103.11. 89 cents less than she had. 89 cents. He could sell one lousy cup of lemonade tomorrow and beat her. And there was nothing she could do about it because she'd been at the beach. I can't let him win, she thought. I just can't. She had gotten to the point where she couldn't even remember what she's, why and what had started the whole war. She couldn't remember why it had been so important to win in the first place. Now she just had to win. She messed up the money and stuffed it back into the box. That night in bed, she lay awake trying to think of some way to stop Evan from selling even a single glass. Sometimes in the dark, dark thoughts come. Jessie had a very dark thought.
The next morning was Sunday, and the rule in the Tresky house was that everyone could sleep in as late as he or she wanted. But Jessie awoke to the sound of the electric garage door opening. She sat up in her bed and checked the clock. It was 8 o'clock a.m. Then she looked out her window just in time to see Evan pedaling away on his bike, his backpack on his back. She quickly dressed and hurried down to the kitchen. Her mom was making scrambled eggs and toast. Hi, Jess. Want some? She asked, pointing with her spatula at the pan of sizzling eggs. No, thanks, she said. I watched her. I watched. I washed your blue bathing suit last night. It's hanging in the basement. What time are you and Megan picking? What time are Maury's parents, Megan's parents picking you up? What time are Megan and her parents picking you up? Nine o'clock, she said. Mom, where did Evan go? He went to the store to buy some lemonade mix. Jessie's mom scooped the eggs into a plate and put the pan in the sink. When she turned on the faucet, the pan hissed like an angry cat, like an angry snake. A great cloud of steam puffed into the air and then disappeared. What's going on, Jess? What's with all the lemonade stands and you and Evan fighting? Jessie opened the pantry cupboard and pulled out a box of kicks. Nothing, she said. She watched the cereal very carefully as she poured. She didn't want to look at her mother right then. Mrs. Tresky got the milk out of the refrigerator and put it on the counter next to Jessie's bowl. It doesn't seem like nothing. It seems like there's a lot of bad feeling between the two of you. Jessie poured her milk slowly. Evan's mad at me, <laughs> and he's going to be a whole lot madder after the day, she added in her head. What's he mad about? asked Mrs. Tresky. I don't know. <clears throat> He called me a baby and said I ruined everything, and Jessie felt it coming. She tried to hold it back, but she knew it was coming. Her shoulders tightened, and her chest caved in, and her mouth opened in a howl. He, he said he hates me, and then tears poured out of her eyes and dropped into her cereal bowl. Her nose started to run and her lips quivered. With every sob, she let out a sound like tires squealing on a wet road. For the first time, Jessie cried. Her mother wrapped her in a hug. And then, like a fa faucet turned off, Jessie stopped. She had told the truth. She really didn't understand why Evan was so angry. Even before the Lemonade War, he had been mad, and Jessie still didn't know why. Better? asked Mrs. Tresky. <laughs> Not much, said Jessie. She wiped her nose with the paper napkin and started eating her cereal. It was soggy, but thankfully not salty. Don't you think it would be a good idea to find out what he's mad about? asked Jessie's mom. You're never going to stop being mad at each other until you both understand what the other person is feeling. I guess so, said Jessie. It can be hard. Sometimes it's even harder to know what you're feeling yourself. I mean, how do you feel about him? asked Mrs. Tresky. Jessie didn't have to think long. All the insults and anger the confusion and fighting seemed to converge into a single flash of white hot feeling. I hate him. I hate him for saying all those mean things and for not letting me play. I hate him just as much as he hates me. More. Mrs. Tresky looked sad. Can we have a sit down about this tonight? After you get back from the beach. No said Jessie, remem remembering the spit bow. Evan would be mad if he knew that she had worried Mom with their fighting. 
and then he spilled the beans about all the terrible about the terrible thing she was about to do jesse didn't want her mom knowing anything about that we'll work it out ourselves mom i promise evan and i will talk tonight i'm sorry i've been working so hard said mrs tresky i know it's a lousy end to the summer it's okay mom you gotta work right yes no i don't know i promise i'll be finished by dinner time tonight that way we can all go to the fireworks together jesse's mom looked out the window i hope they don't get canceled because of the weather they're saying scattered thunderstorms this evening jesse and her mom finished breakfast without saying much else i'll clean up said jesse she liked to do dishes and she wanted to do something nice for her mom while she cleaned she thought about the terrible plan she had come up with last night it was mean it was really mean it was the meanest thing she had ever imagined doing i'm not gonna do it she decided i hate him but i don't hate him that much she was putting the last glass in the dishwasher when evan walked in his backpack was bulging i thought you were going to the beach for the whole day he asked megan's picking me up in a half an hour she thought she thought she could uh she thought she saw evan stiffen up good what's in the backpack not much he said dumping out the contents into the kitchen table cans of lemonade mix rolled all over jesse tried to count but there were too many 15 20 holy macaroni how many cans did you buy 32 evan started to stack the cans in a pyramid but but you don't need that much even to win you don't need that much that's that's she did the calculations in her head that's 256 cups of lemonade if you sell them at 50 cents a piece a dollar i'm going to charge a dollar a piece jesse felt like her head was going to explode you never sell it all she said there isn't a neighborhood in town that will buy 256 cups in one day too much lemonade not enough thirsty people she thought i'm going to roll like the ice cream truck i'm going to mix it all up in the big cooler and wagon it from street to street the high today is going to be 94 degrees it might take me all day but i'm going to sell every last drop 256 smackers and then tonight juicy we count our earnings don't forget winner takes all but you don't need 256 dollars to win she shouted evan stood tall and said in that gravely voice that all the boys imitated i don't play to win i play to pulverize oh what an idiot jesse couldn't believe her brother could be such a jerk she watched as evan put together his rolling lemonade stand in the garage the big cooler was something mrs tresky had bought a few years back when she was in charge of refreshments for the school spring fling it looked like a giant bongo drum with a screw off top and a spigot at the bottom and a spigot at the bottom evan loaded it into the wagon then poured in the mix from all 32 cans he used the garden hose to fill the cooler to the top then dumped in four trays of ice cubes with a plastic beach shovel he stirred the lemonade the ice cubes made a weird rattling noise as they swirled around in the big drum using the shovel like a big spoon he scooped out a tiny bit and tasted it perfect he announced screwing the top on tightly then he went into the basement 
to make his lemonade on wheels sign. Without a moment's hesitation, Jessie sprang into action. First, she got a large Ziploc bag from the kitchen drawer, the kind that you could freeze a whole gal in the strawberries in if you wanted to. Then she held it upside down and wide open, and then over the fruit bowl. She gave the bowl a solid knock. Jessie was surprised how easy it was to catch the fruit flies that floated up from the bowl. It was like she wanted to die. She filled, she filled that bag and two more with flies, then hurried to the garage. She unscrewed the top of the big cooler. Holding the first bag upside down, she unzipped it, expecting the flies to fall down into, into the lemonade. They didn't. They stayed safe and dry in the bag. It was like they wanted to live. Too bad for you, you stupid flies said Jessie as she plunged the bag into the lemonade. Under the surface, she turned the bag inside out, swishing it back and forth so that all the flies were washed off into the lemonade. She emptied all three bags of the flies into the big cooler, then hunted around until she found two green inchworms and a fuzzy gypsy moth caterpillar she tossed them into the cooler then she threw a fistful of dirt for good measure oh my god she was just about to screw the top back on when she heard evan coming up the basement stairs there wasn't enough time to get the top back on. He would see the bugs and the whole plan would be ruined. Jessie ran to the steps and shouted, Evan, mom wants to see you in her office right away. Oh, man, muttered Evan as he started to climb the second set of stairs. Jessie quickly screwed on the cap. She grabbed her blue bathing suit from the basement, then went upstairs to her room. On the way, she passed Evan coming down. Mom did not want to see me, he said, annoyed. Jessie looked surprised. That's what it sounded like. She yelled something down the stairs. I thought it was get Evan. Jessie shrugged. So I got you. From her bedroom window, she watched Evan rolling down the street with his lemonade on wheel stand. He was like one of those old-time peddlers calling out, Lemonade! Get your ice cold lemonade here! As he walked, for one lightning brief second, Jessie felt a stab of regret. She could see how hard he was straining to pull the heavy cooler. She knew what it was like to stand in the hot sun selling lemonade. But the feeling was snuffed out by the hurricane of anger she felt when she remembered Evans gravely voice pulverize. Jessie switched into her bathing suit, packed up her beach bag, and said a quick goodbye to her mother as Megan's parents pulled into the driveway. What a great day for the beach, said her mother. Have fun and be home in time for the fireworks, okay? The fireworks, yep. Yeah. Jessie imagined there would be some fireworks tonight. Okay, that was chapters 8 through 10 of The Lemonade War. Stay on the lookout for chapter 11, A Total Loss.